Uh, again, there was a number of them there. I saw a couple of new faces, and uh, let me go ahead and make a plug. Uh, if you'd like to join the choir, Brother Paul would love to have him, and uh, they do a great job. Enjoy the music very much, and uh, pray that's uh, certainly helping prepare you for uh, the message of God's Word. Pray that God's Word will be good to you today. I want you to take your attention uh, to the book of 1 Peter. I'd like to invite you there. First chapter of the book of 1 Peter. And uh, I want to deal with a subject this morning that I think, again, is pertinent for a new year. And uh, certainly not just for 2016, but it's really a reminder for us as Christians uh, to, to uh, rem a reminder about the seriousness of our task of being just that, of being a Christian. The Bible says in Acts chapter 11, they were first called Christians in Antioch. And uh, in that first century, that was meant uh, as a derogatory term. I'm sure you've heard that before. It was a slanderous word. It was a word that was meant to be a mocking word, a word that was uh, meant to be shameful. But I would tell you this morning, I doubt those Christians in Antioch, I doubt they saw it that way. I think they saw it as a compliment, you know, to be like the Lord. For to be a Christian means that you mimic, you look like, you act like, you think like, you talk like, anything that's like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a good reason to be a Christian, don't you think? That concept, again, and that, by the way, in our world here, you know, 20-some centuries later, I doubt it's changed very much. I don't know that being a Christian necessarily across the world is viewed as a good thing. Uh, that, that's something that's viewed as a bit of a mockery and uh, maybe something that's a bit outdated and, uh, you know, something that's uh, viewed as, as uh, you know, not beneficial and not helpful. You know, we always talk about as Christianity a, a measure of changing the world, and many people today are wondering whether or not Christianity truly is going to change the world. But for us Christians, we know it does. Amen. We know it's not just a world changer. Let's face the facts. I mean, it's a personal life changer first. Amen. Ultimately, when the gospel and when John 3, 16, when God says that God so loved the world, when the world becomes real small and you realize that God loves you, I mean, at that moment, we really could care less if it's a world changer as much as a life changer. Is that right or not? Well, the idea of being a Christian, and uh, you know what a joy it is today to gather together. Again, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, uh, let me kind of back that up a little bit by saying it this way. You're not, uh, you're not physically born as a Christian, right? So you're not a Christian by physical birth. That means your family, though they may have been Christian, your parents, that doesn't make you one to start with, right? You're not a Christian because you attend church. Matter of fact, just ask lots of Christians who do attend church. Amen. You're not a Christian because, you know, you, you attend a certain church. You're not a Christian because you, you're a member of a church. You're a Christian because you have chosen by faith to put your trust of eternity into Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that's how you get saved. That's how salvation changes your life. The Bible speaks of that as being born again. And that being born again, both uh, really of the spiritual birth, having the Spirit of God uh, born you again. I know that's not right grammar, but that's the right idea. To born you again in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and that is what makes us Christian in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to challenge you, because you may be a Christian in faith, in your belief, and in your born-again salvation. Listen, there needs to be a choice every day of your life to be a Christian. Amen. Again, I've heard it so many times, people, I don't want to go to that church that's full of hypocrites. And, you know, let's face it, uh, our church has none of those. Bless God, amen. We don't have hypocrites at South Wind. We don't allow them to join, right? We all know that's, that's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek, right? We all know because, because the church is made up of people, and people are not perfect, you know, right, in their behaviors. And, and we're, we're, we're reminded again as we approach a new year, we're reminded as Christians, I want to remind you, and I want to challenge you, that we need to be Christian by choice, even as believers. We, we need to be, you know, let me say it this way, because we want to approach a subject called sanctification or holiness, and, and we want to be, uh, here's the title of the message, it's called Different by Choice. We want to be different. Now, different for a different sake is just not what we're after. By the way, everybody's different, amen? 
Isn't it amazing? Uh, I love walking around. My, my wife is elbowing me all the time. If we're in a public place, I stare at people all day long. You know, she's all the time, quit staring. I said, yeah, but you, have you seen that person right there? Look at that. That is free entertainment right there. Amen. Don't cost you a dime, you know. That is good stuff. You know, I love to pick out, you know, married couples. I said, well, that, that man and that woman go together, you know, and how do you know that? Because they're fighting. You know, if you're over 55 and married, you know, have been married maybe a long, you can kind of, well, they go together because they just look alike. They act alike. They talk alike. They think alike. You know, and they're still arguing. Amen. You know, there's, I just love to watch people. People are different. You know, we look around the, the, the crowd this morning. We're just different. And some of us are different by choice. Some of us aren't. You know, you know where I'm headed with that one, right? You know. Some of you are just different. And it wasn't your choice. It was God's choice for you. You don't have any hair left. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can't see, right? You, you're blind. You can't hear anything, you know. You're, and that's not your choice necessarily. And uh, you're different. I want to say to you this morning that to be different as a Christian, I think there's this real conflict in many people's lives about being different. Uh, in our world, to be a Christian, again, is viewed as, a, as different that's not good for you. You know? I, I hear people talk about it all the time, and there are several ways to look at this. They're, they're, you know, Christianity as a whole viewed by a world that's not Christian, and it's often viewed in a, in a negative light. But, but it also goes down into the areas of, you know, like denominations, for example. Can, can I tell you that Baptists don't have a good name? Is that, is that a surprise to anybody, you know? Baptists don't have a good name in the world in which we live. By the way, can I tell you, I think that's shameful for us by a lot of measures because oftentimes what makes us different is not necessarily a good choice. You know, we hear people talk about Baptists. Boy, all they do is condemn people. All they do, they don't love anybody. You know? And can I tell you honestly that the greatest commandment is to love God and the second one's like unto it is to love your neighbor. I mean, the one thing that ought to mark us, and I, I know I'm talking generalities here, but the one thing that ought to mark every church, I don't care if it's Baptist or any other, if they truly preach and teach the Bible and truly teach and preach Jesus Christ, there ought to be a measure of love that just oozes out of every church that anybody who doesn't know anything about God ought to want to be there and stay there. Is that right or no? I mean, I, that, how, how true is that? But oftentimes what makes us different, now whether you're a Christian and different, maybe it's because we're Baptists. By the way, let me say this again. I'm a Baptist preacher. By the way, I am not ashamed of that. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed to stand up for Baptists. I am one. We, we are one. Amen. We, we're going to be one. And we're going to stay one. You know, and, and by the way, we're a Baptist church. It's not just me. We're a Baptist church. And please understand, I'm going to be real careful as I say this, but let me say it. We are not taking Baptists off our side. Now, all the old people are amen on that. All the younger people think, oh, boy, I don't know. What have I got into, you know? What in the world is happening? The worship service just went down the tube, you know? Listen, we, we shouldn't be ashamed of that. Because being Baptist means we believe in something specific. Number one, I would say this, and I've heard this recently the last few days that uh, as, a, as a church, we want to be known that we teach and preach the Bible. We teach and preach the Bible. That's what we do. You want to come to South Winds? We are going to put you in a chair, and we're going to teach the Bible to you. That's what we do. And uh, if you're here and you're in a chair in our, in our services and you don't know Christ, we want to tell you about how to get saved. Right? That's what we do. And uh, by the way, around some of that stuff, we sing a little bit, you know, and, um, you know, we, uh, we, fun, we have fun, we fellowship, we do all kinds of crazy things, you know, we, whatever. Whatever we do around all that, but that's what we do. By the way, let me say this again. I'm kind of meddling here. I'm, I'm a little soapbox. I'm going to be glad to say it. That, you know, our church wants to be marked that we love music and we sing with passion unto the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me say this. Music will never be our calling call. Can I say that again? It will never be. What we will always put out front is the Scriptures and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's not, I say that with conviction. I don't say that challenging. I don't say that, you know, in somebody's face. The fact of the matter is many churches are not distinct or different because they preach the Bible. Many are not. I've been to several of those, you know, through the years. 
been to a couple of churches. I got done, we dismissed, and went out to my car, and I asked my wife, well, what did we just do? What, what was that about? That was bizarre because all they did was talk about the bizarre. You with me on that? It's a little personal story. And I thought, well, what, 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 did, what did churches do? You know, churches ought to be distinct because we are willing to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ in every way, shape, and form. We'll sing with passion. We'll teach with passion. But in the end, our calling card has to be the good news about Jesus Christ. Now, I want to challenge you because your life needs to be just like that too. Your life needs to be a display of the scriptures and the word of God and, and the causes of Jesus Christ, whether you're at church or whether it's Monday morning or Friday afternoon. And the choice to be different. In the end, different is, is good as long as your difference is for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to remind you about that. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1. We really find the whole premise of that idea beginning in verse number 15. He says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Make no mistake, the word conversation there is not just talking, and that's not just what you talk about. The word in the Greek, as you know, refers to our behavior, our manner of living, our lifestyle. It would include your talk. It would include that. But it's more than just your conversation. It's your entire lifestyle. He says you need to be holy as God is holy. Verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. By the way, there, there, when it comes to being different by choice, I want to say just that. We need to be different because of Christ, but it's your choice. By the way, aren't you glad for that? I'm so glad that God gave us a free will. On some hands, on some respects, I think it would be a lot easier. Church would be a lot easier. Pastoring would be a lot easier if Christians were robots. You know, we just program them and we just turn them loose, you know. Every day of the week you win somebody to Christ. Never miss church. You know, you, you tithe 25%. <laughs> we can program that, by the way. We can up that or lower that, depending on you, you know. We can set the program. You tithe 73% this week, you know. The point is that it's, we're not robots. God gives us a free will, and he wants us to freely choose. In other words, the, the, the title of the message is exactly what we want to tackle. We are different because of Christ, but God gives us the choice to choose to be that way. And in the end, as the Bible talks about, our gathering together for the purpose of worshiping God, as, as the book of Proverbs talks about, iron sharpening iron, right? We talk about New Testament discipleship and edifying the brethren. We talk about the good news of Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel. All of those ideas are involved in helping us to be better at being different by choice. It's your choice, but can we all agree this morning that choosing to be different and to be like God, that's a right choice. That's a right choice. There are many people today who want to debate that. You know, is church good for me? I remember again years ago, uh, I, was in a, I was on my job actually, and I had a coworker. I may have shared this story with you before, I don't recall, but I had a coworker tell me, he said, man, I don't have to go to church to worship God. I can worship God out there on the street corner. So, well, okay, I'm not going to argue about that with you but the street corner is not where God said to meet. God said to gather yourselves together on the first day of the week as you assemble with the church. I mean, it's not, so it's not about what you can do in terms of worship on your own way. The fact is God said we have to do it in assembling together, and God specifically said the first day of the week is my day. So it's not about whether you can worship on your own. I mean, it's not about your choice. It's not about being different because of your choice. It's the fact that you freely choose to honor God through your choice of being different and like the Lord. Peter reminds us. By the way, I wish Peter were here to preach this message. I feel like he'd do a better job than me. You know, I mean, if Peter showed up this morning, we would all be at the altar. Amen. I'd be the first one. I mean, if Peter showed up, you know, Peter coming. I think Peter, you know, we all know Peter cuts right to the chase. And he's just going to get right down to the core of the matter, and he's going to come in and say, hey, you need to be holy. Get busy. And I think Peter, as an apostle, we would all tuck and run because he would walk around, I think, around the room. He'd say, hey, Rob, I know you. 
Amen. I know you. I know what's going on in your life. You need to get right with God. Right now, if Peter showed up and if he did that, we would all be at Matter of fact, most of us would run out the door and get in our car and leave. Right? Because now we're, we're, we're avoiding the point that to be different is really about God dealing with the areas in our life that need to be different. And it's God working in those areas that God says, I need you to be like me, but this area here is not like me. I need you to work on that. I want to work in that area. Let's deal with that. And the concept of being different. Separation, there are several words, by the way, we can use for being different. The, the biblical term is sanctification or sanctity. Another word that's identical to the word sanctity in the New Testament is the word holy. So we're talking about different, we're talking about holiness, and we're talking about sanctity and or separation. And so let's be honest, though, separation is really seen through two very different lenses. In other words, there's an evil lens of being different, and that is this, where the difference is championed by its lack of boundaries and its dissimilarities to anything godly. You with me on that point? The world says, hey, we want to be different. Just be different. Matter of fact, that your life ought to be different than everybody else, but we don't want it to be like God. Be who you want to be. Follow your heart. You know, whatever the, the principles and the particular uh, grounding effects are, you know, so just follow your heart. Well, let's remind ourselves that God said the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. You dare not trust your heart. But that's what the world is saying is good. So different through the evil lens is saying, you know, by, by the way, we're sick of boundaries, right? We're sick of limitations, we don't want any kind of structure or standards. We don't want any kind of boundaries in life. We just want to do what we want to do. By the way, I just preached a, a, a taught a lesson in Sunday school this morning uh, from the book of Judges on Samson. And the, the one verse that describes the time of the Judges, 300 years worth of Israel's history, is known as every man doing that which was right in his own eye. 300 years worth of history. But that sounds like today a little bit, doesn't it? It's that idea that you can be separate and different, but do it how you want. Kids don't want the boundaries of parents. Parents don't want the boundaries of family or marriage. Families don't want the boundaries that God has set for the family. The employee doesn't want the boundaries of the job. Christians don't want the boundaries of holiness that God has set. And we're doing our best, our flesh is doing its best to throw off those boundaries rather than champion them. And I would submit to you that the other lens, though one is evil, the other is godly. A godly lens is a lens where we see separation as being the difference is championed by its God-given boundaries. In other words, when God says, here's how the marriage is supposed to work, man, man with a woman. And we can amen that one, but here's another thing. Men, love your wives as God loved the church. And women, submit yourself to your husbands. By the way, my message is not even about marriage. I mean, it's just a natural filter. But what happens is when marriages throw off the boundaries of God, it's no wonder they wind up in divorce. It's no wonder that we're not happy in the marriage. It's no wonder that love is not the characteristic of the relationship. Again, that, that kind of statement, well, we, we love each other, we want to get married, but pretty soon it sounds like this, we don't love each other anymore. We don't want to be together anymore. Really? I mean, again, God, God is established. And so the point being is that really the godly lens of difference is when we don't throw off the boundaries of God, we champion the boundaries of God. When the Bible says children to obey your parents, there's no negotiation about that. I mean, it doesn't say obey your parents as long as your parents demonstrate wisdom and you know, logical decision making. It doesn't say obey your parents as long as your parents aren't knuckleheads. And though every teenager thinks that, right? I mean, th that's not the point. The point is you, you, you do what God says set as a boundary. 
we then conclude a couple things about being different. Our separation and our holiness unto God is really an issue of difference by choice. If there's one, uh, again, I shared in Sunday school about Samson. If there's one conflicting Bible character where it demonstrates the mighty hand of God on his life, and yet a life of tragic, failed decision-making and holiness unto God, it's Samson. Samson demonstrated the power of God to push over the Philistine arena, and yet he does it as a slave and with his eyes gouged out because he failed to be different for God. Well, what a tragic story. Well, what, a, what a terrible ending. So, yeah, but, you know, God gave him power to push over the arena. Absolutely God did. But think of what God could have done with his life had he been different for God. Think about what God could do in life. Well, the concept, again, of separation. We need to reaffirm then, and I'm really talking to believers this morning, the gospel is here. The, the gospel message is very clear that as of right now, as if you're lost this morning, you are not like God. You are different than God. You're lost, and you need to be saved. So, so we think about Christians, and by the way, that choice to believe upon Christ makes you like him, and therefore then as a Christian, we need to reaffirm our daily choices to be holy unto God. Let me consider three or four thoughts about choosing to be holy. First of all, let me remind you this. That our choice is actually made by controlling and using our self-will to honor God. As much as God has given you a self-will, you can use your self-will for self-pleasure. But can I say this morning, it's a really simple thought, that if you want to be different by choice, then use your will to choose to be like God. Now that sounds simple. I mean, that's about as basic as it gets in terms of Christianity. But let's, re let's remember a couple things. That means then that we, that we control our self-will to not choose the flesh. I want you to turn in your Bibles uh, over to the book of Numbers chapter 6. For those in my Sunday school class, we're going to revisit Numbers chapter 6 for a couple of moments here. This is what's referred to as the Nazarite vow. We don't have time to get into the entire idea of the Nazarite vow, but here in Numbers chapter 6, God gives Moses the instruction concerning the Nazarite vow. By the way, Samson was under a Nazarite vow. The vow had some particular details to the vow, but I want you to notice here in verse number 1 and 2 of Numbers chapter 6, particularly about choosing to use our self-will to not choose flesh. Verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate, what's the next word? Themselves. Separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto who? You choose to separate yourself unto the Lord. By the way, again, let's make it very clear. As much as you have a self-will, you can use your will to choose evil or to choose righteousness. Romans chapter 6 is the, is the, the bedrock of, of the truth of using your will to choose not yourself and not your flesh, but to choose God instead. Real simple thing. Again, choosing to honor God through controlling the will means, first of all, we don't choose the flesh. Now, remember what Peter said there, and Peter, we won't go back there, but what Peter said is, be ye holy unto the Lord in all manner of conversation. In all manner of lifestyle. Can I, can I say something this morning that I think needs to be reminded to Christians? Listen, a foul mouth is not okay with God. Now I understand, I understand that the, a foul mouth is not any different than being given to wine or intoxicating drinks. It's not any different than having desires towards adultery or fornication. The, the, the concept is, that we need to be reminded that Peter says, be holy unto God in all manner of behavior. We're often so quick to point the finger at people because of their ill-mannered life. 
and yet we won't point the one at, at ourselves. There's a few things that seem to be slipping in terms of our being committed to being different. Language is one of those. Most of us would not agree that being drunk is a good thing. But by the way, can I remind you that the Nazarite vow right here in Numbers chapter 6, one of the key features is not being given to the fruit of the vine. And yet in our world today, let me, let me deal with it. In our world today in Christianity, the fruit of the vine is one of the most tragic areas of a loss of difference. You and I need to be reminded that our choice is all manner of conversation. It's really not even a matter of drunkenness. It's a matter of saying to God, I choose to control myself that in all manner of conversation, in every area, I will be given over unto the Lord. Now, by the way, nobody's perfect. I'm not even suggesting we can find perfection. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm saying is, in the areas in your life that are soft and weak, Understand the need to use your self-will to choose to honor God by controlling it for Him. Does that make sense this morning? I never had a problem with language. Never had a problem saying bad words. Matter of fact, I think it probably could because when I was little, if I said a bad word, there were consequences. You with me on that? Matter of fact, we didn't even say a, a foul word or a, you know, a word that was even you know, derogatory. You know, we didn't say certain words in our house because they were Christian curse words. You with me on that? The point is that we all have those areas where the will is weak to choose flesh over God. And God says, control your will to not choose the flesh and choose to honor God. Controlling the self-will is to commit ourselves to a higher purpose. There's one foundational truth about choosing yourself over God. Here we go now. It's choosing, it's choosing to live life according to your purpose rather than God's. Bottom line, it doesn't even matter what your purpose is. It doesn't matter what your desires are. It does not matter the nth degree details of your choices, but when you put your choices ahead of God's purpose, then you got problems. Is that right? It doesn't even matter what the choice is. So I just, uh, I choose to put family over God. All right, but that's a wrong choice. Why? I've heard people say, well, I, I love my kids more than anything in the world, and that's why, that's why we're not going to worship God so we can spend time with the family. Wrong choice. Matter of fact, why not bring the family and teach the kids how to worship God with the family? But often we see it as distinct if we're not careful. Others, you know, whether it's money or jobs or entertainments or whatever, pleasure of some sort, we can put all things in front of God. Please understand, I'm not preaching from a high pedestal. I'm preaching to all of us. Because in all of our families this morning, in all of our lives, we need to control the will to commit ourselves to God's higher purpose. Can I remind you again that choosing to be different unto God sometimes is not comfortable. Sometimes it does not feel good. It does not feel good to put yourself in a situation where you're serving the purposes of God and yet you are in an uncomfortable situation. But clearly one of the most uh, the great points of that is, is trying to win somebody to Christ. I've shared stories with you before in my own life where trying to engage people. By the way, I was a backward introverted kid growing up. I didn't want to talk to anybody. And yet the reality, God says, Andy, I want you to be in ministry. Okay, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just don't ask me to talk to people. I'm okay with that one. Lo and behold, every time we turn around, God is saying, Andy, talk to that person. They need to hear about God. You with me on this? Let's be honest, talking to people about God, especially at times to people who don't necessarily want to hear about God, that is not always comfortable, but the choice to control your will to serve God's purpose is a greater choice than choosing yourself. Well, the idea of uh, singing in the choir, teaching Sunday school, working in some event, 
I mean, the list goes on and on. A higher purpose of the Lord. Also controlling our self-will to choose to be holy unto God. Let me give you the, the first choice you should make about your will. It's not just serving God's higher purpose of the gospel, though that is right towards the top. But can I give you the first priority in your choice? Is that you are to be holy. In other words, you can spit out gospel everywhere you go, but if you are not holy, James says it this way in verse 25 of chapter 1. He basically says this, this man will not be fruitful in his deed. God might take the verses that you share and plant the seed of the gospel in somebody else, but listen to me, you walk away from the deed, you walk away bankrupt from any fruit that God had intended for you because you're not holy. Listen to me, that's why many people today are frustrated and disillusioned about Christianity because all we've done is serve God, but I, I'm just not happy. It's not fulfilling. I'm tired of my church. I'm tired of those people. It's because you are void of the fruit that God has planned for you because in the deed, God is more concerned about you being holy than just doing holy work. Well, what a challenge. It's the reaffirming of our choice to be different, different unto God. If any man chooses, it's the controlling our self-will to honor God. Let me give you a second point quickly. It's also found here in number six, and that is this. I think this is great for you and I, is that it's a choice to be different. It's a choice made based on precedence. The Bible says here in number six, if basically, if any man or woman of Israel, I wonder how many of them chose to be a Nazarite. Typically, the, the choice was a 30 to 60 day commitment or vow. It wasn't necessarily a lifelong, though Samson was one chosen by God as a lifelong Nazarite and his vow to be holy to God. In Israel, it was typically a, a temporary time period of which you gave yourself to God. Matter of fact, the Nazarite vow for the average Israelite was similar to being a priest, holy unto God living by godly standards. Though the average Israelite did not perform the functions of the sanctuary like the priest, it was their way to become temporarily sanctified unto God like the priesthood. And I wonder how many of them chose to be a Nazarite. I wonder how many through the centuries of time. Here we are in, you know, 2016 now. and I mean, let's go back to 2000 B.C. Let's go back 4,000 years ago. I wonder how many of them, hearing Moses teach on it, said, you know what? I think that's a good choice. I'll do that starting tomorrow. Praise the Lord. By the way, we have a few of them in Scripture. One of those that we know about is the Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 16, 17, 18. I didn't there. I didn't write the reference down. Paul had a Nazarite vow because he chose it. I love what Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter 12, and I refer to this verse quite often. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race with patience, setting aside those things that do so easily beset us. Running with patience the race set before us. I mean, if Paul and Peter were to show up in our services today, I think they would stand at the door and say, hey, good job, good choice, keep going. We know what you're going through. We made the same choice too. It's a right decision. Hang in there. There's thousands of Christians, millions of Christians who've made the choice to be holy unto God, just like we should. I think about my parents. I think about my grandparents. I think about Pastor Pappy Spencer. He was the pastor at Central Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Illinois, who led my mom and my dad to Christ. He chose to be different. And ones before him, and all on the way back through history and time. You know what I'm talking about. It's, it, there's a precedent set. There were those in Israel who chose this Nazarite vow. That's a good choice. Let's be different for God. There are men like Paul and Peter. We see Peter dealing with a conflict in his own heart, where on one night he denies the Lord three times. A few days later, though, he's chosen God again. He's chosen God not just for the day, but he's chosen God emphatically. 
He's rebounded from his dreadful night of denial to now stand on the day of Pentecost and preach unto thousands of people and clearly claim his choice of God for his life. How many of us have had dreadful denial and yet can rebound to a place where we say to God today, I choose God because it's the right thing and there's been others go before me on such decisions. I wish others could stand with us. Many of you could give an account of someone who's gone before you. Well, the precedent is certainly there. It was Joshua who said unto the nation of Israel, choose you this day. Joshua 24, 15. It was uh, the harlot, the prostitute Rahab, there and from Jericho, where, where when the two men showed up in her house as spies in the land, she said to them, we have heard about your God. And Mike Minnow, the city is trembling at the reality of Israel at our doorsteps. And we know, we know what your God did to Sihon and Og on the other side of Jordan. We heard about those stories 40 years ago. And I choose this day, will you this day save me from the wrath to come? Rahab chose God. Daniel chose the Lord. Daniel tells the most powerful king of the world at the time, the the king of Babylon, and he says, I will not eat your meat. I will not drink your wine. I will not choose to serve your God. And if the consequences come, so be it. He winds up in the lion's den using a fluffy mane for his pillow. You with me on this point? David chose God. David also, like Peter, rebounded from a horrible situation. I love David, though, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, where as a little ruddy youth, it says, a little red-headed, freckle-faced kid showing up with some food for his brothers, shows up, and he sees across the valley, the Philistine army across the valley of Elah. He looks on this side where the Israelites are cowering away, and there in the valley of Elah is the nine-foot, six-inch giant Goliath shaking his fist in the face of God. And David looks around at his brothers, and he says, Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Are there not those who need Christ? Are there not those who need an example of righteousness? David says, well, I'll be the guy. I don't know what you're doing, Eliab. You're you big dummy. you big goof. You're my brother and you're a coward. That's the Andy Chute version of that scripture. Puts on Saul the king's armor. He can't even maneuver. Throw that stuff off. He goes down to the brook Cherith, finds him five little smooth stones. These will do well. By the way, he only needed one. (laughs) By the way, Goliath had four brothers, if you didn't know. The Bible says it gives them by name, four other brothers. I think David had a bigger picture in mind. He had a bigger cause than just the valley. If he had some big goof down there in the valley, I'll take care of you and your family because I choose God. I'll learn verse 48 of 1 Samuel 17 where the Bible says that David, when he was prepared, had nothing on except his little shepherd clothes and a sling in his hand and some stones in his, in his pocket. He said, okay, now the Bible says he ran and hasted at the giant. Can you imagine giant, the Goliath standing there, what in the world is this little kid doing? He's running at me. He was the champion, by the way, of the Philistine army. He was undefeated. They boasted him. He had stood out there for 40 days shaking his fist in the face of God. Please understand, David chose to be different. He chose to be different. The the list goes on and on. I thought about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Gideon, Samuel. The, the, The list goes on and on of the precedent of choosing to be different. According to what Peter said, let me give you a third point quickly, and that is simply this, that our choice to be different is motivated by really one thing. And in verse 15 there in 1 Peter, what it said was, as it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. There's one reason to be different. Can I tell you that as a church, we we are not interested in being different from other churches just to be different from other churches? Most churches are in competition with each other, quite honestly. They run, I think, marketing campaigns in which to get people to come to their church. As a matter of fact, most churches are, are, are trying to do the bigger and better thing. 
Can I tell you there's one reason that will keep people serving the Lord? It's the holiness of God. Let me say that again. There's one thing that will keep you consistently choosing to be different unto God, and that is the holiness of God. Let me say it this way. There are enough circumstances and situations in your life by which you have every occasion to not choose God, but there's one reason that will keep you there. If you have a right perspective of a holy God, listen, you will be back next Sunday. If you have a right view of God, you will be concerned tomorrow for your coworkers about eternity. If you have a right view of God, you will come into church on Sunday. It does not matter the song we sing. You will sing with passion. If you have a right view of God, it doesn't matter who you sit next to in the seat. If you have a right view of God, it doesn't matter what ministry you're involved in. You're willing to do them all. Listen, things of, things of choosing God and the reasons, listen, if your reason for being involved in a particular ministry is because that's the only one you want to do and you don't want to do the others, that is a wrong reason. That is a wrong reason. If the reason you don't show up is because you are thinking about yourself first and foremost, listen, that is a wrong reason to be choosing to be different. And in the end, God is very clear. There's one thing that motivates us. There's one thing that keeps your music passionate. There's one thing that keeps your daily Christian life on fervor and on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's when you stand before the throne of God on a daily basis and you see a holy God sitting on a holy throne and the right view of yourself is, who am I that I should stand before him? It's a view of God like none other. By the way, you get that view through a few reasons. You get that view through God's Word. Spending time in the Bible will give you a view of God like none other. You mark it down. Those that have struggle of understanding God and the reason why they choose to be different, you mark it down. Go inventory their daily time in the Word. Take inventory. I guarantee you'll find a correlation. Well, the challenge that we have of a right reason. There's one reason. A choice is motivated by the holiness of God. A right view of God on the throne. Finally, it's our choice that motivates us to do good things, good works. I want you to turn over to Titus chapter 2. And I want to show you one more verse of scripture before we finish up this morning. Titus chapter 2. Paul, as he writes to Young Titus, his understudy, one of his young preacher boys, he writes to him in the second chapter beginning in verse 11, and he says in verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. By the way, that's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. What appeared to all men is the arrival of the holy God in human form, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, Titus chapter 2. Here's what that salvation did. He says that teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now notice here, verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now let me, let me touch on here. There's one thing your salvation should do. It should create in you a fire to do good works. Do some inventory. Check your fire for serving God. Check it out. I mean, it's one thing to, you know, have the holiness of God in your own life, your life to be holy. But God says there's one thing, there's one peculiarity about the people of God who've been redeemed is that they have a zealousness for good works. They have a desire to do what God wants us to do. That's why you have a willingness to do anything God asks of you. By the way, uh, why do you think missionaries wind up on the mission field? It's because they're superhero people, right? The Mapes are here this morning, 35 years, 30 years in Ghana. 
Listen, there's one thing I've learned about the Mapes. I love them to death. I've sat down with Brother Mapes and visit with him. Listen, they're just normal people. They're normal people. I didn't think they were for going to Ghana. Amen. But guess what? It's normal because God says, I want you to do this. And we say, okay. You with me on this point? Sometimes we think missionaries are, are just a crazy, you know, crazy superhero people. By the way, they are crazy superheroes in some respects, humanity speaking. But in reality, they're just normal people willing to do whatever God wants. Now, for some of us, God didn't ask us to go to Ghana or any other place in the world. What he's asking us to do is do the good works right in front of you every day of your life. You don't have to go anywhere other than which you already go and serve the Lord. Do it with a zealousness. Do it with a fervor. Do it with a vigor. Have a willingness to do it. A choice is marked by a, by a motivation that moves us to do Good works. And what he says in verse 14, you're peculiar because I have purified you. Now, please understand what he's talking about here. There's a reason why we have a desire for good works. It's because God has removed the filthiness of your lost condition. The, po- the peculiarity is because he has cleansed you and redeemed you from your fleshly sinful. Think of it this way. As a Christian then, the only reason we're filthy is because we choose to. Is that right? The only reason a Christian is filthy is because we've chosen to go back to our vomit like the dove. God said, I've redeemed you. I've purified you. I've cleansed you from the filthiness of your flesh. And now you're peculiar. You have this zealousness unto good works that nobody else has. In the end, it's a mark of difference. That's why, that's why the lost world doesn't understand why we show up at church all the time. That, that, that's why the lost world doesn't understand why we're willing to give of our time to do other things. That's why we have the courage to tell people about Christ. That's why we spend the time in devotions and in preparing in God's Word to tell somebody else. That's why we give of our time to memorize Scripture and work with children and learn music. That's why we give of our time, because we are different than everybody else. And in the end, our difference is what marks us as peculiar. It's the mark of a Christian. It's the mark of difference for serving and choosing God. In the end, we remind ourselves of something we've heard all along. Today's message is not new information. It's just a reaffirming of our choice to be different. So I ask you this morning, are you different? I've asked myself that a couple times this week. Oh, Lord, sometimes I don't like what I see. Sometimes I like to think that I'm real different. But, boy, there's a few times I pause and I look at my choice. Oh, man, I blew that one again. By the way, anybody else feel like that? I blew that one again. Been there before, done that. Spend the time in confession before the Lord and make another choice. I think sometimes... I'm ashamed to come before God because my prayer sounds something like this. Lord, forgive me. I did it again. I did that one again. And I want you to know, I want you to know, I agree with you. You're right, and I'm wrong. And, Lord, I'm sorry for having to make this very same prayer again. I'm sorry for that one. But I want you to know I choose you. I choose you again. And I think sometimes God gets tired of hearing my prayer. And then I remember what James said. James said there in chapter number 2, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. But if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and give it to all men liberally, and he upbraideth not. For God loves us to ask. Can I remind you and tell you that God never gets tired of you asking him? He never gets tired of you telling God, I'm sorry for that one. I choose you. And by the way, that word upbraided in James 1, 5, what that means, he doesn't keep record. Oh, and he's been here three other times this week, so you're out of options. You've used up all your choices. Oh, you've been here 72 times this year. 
Oh, well, you're just fresh out. Thank God he doesn't act that way. God says he gives it to all men liberally. I think it's just a reminder. When we say to God, I choose you over my flesh. I choose to be different like everybody before me. I choose to be different because you are holy, and I choose to be different and motivated by good works. And God says, guess what? I have enough for you. I have enough power. I have enough wisdom. I have enough courage. I have enough whatever you need. And by the way, I've got more where that came from. Don't, don't forget where you got it. It's a choice to be different. I would submit to you a couple things as we finish up. Final thoughts. Our church, we need ourselves to continue to choose to be different. We need that. Iron sharpens iron. Your choice to be holy for God can impact people around you in a positive way where we say, you know what, that's a right choice, I'll do it with you. And it's a right thing. Our community needs us to choose to be different. People in our community need us to be different for the Lord. And the world needs us to be different. The world needs us to be different. Can I remind you again that our choice today to be godly and different can have an impact in every country that we have missions fingers in? Our choice to be different can impact Brother, Brother Vladimir Krushina in the Ukraine. Brother Vlad, uh, Vladdy, I haven't met him yet personally. Actually, I did meet him about, about seven years ago for about that long. And I see him on Facebook, that dude's crazy. I can't wait to meet him and visit with him more. You know, can I tell you, I, I can tell his choice to be godly from the Ukraine affects me here in Tumba. I see a man in the Ukraine who is Russian. I see a man who is passionate about the Lord. Everything he talks about is from God. Everything he takes pictures of and puts on Facebook is something to do with the cause of Christ. I'm thinking, man, that guy, that guy's contagious. I'm not promoting Facebook. What I'm promoting is a choice to be godly, and there's no limit to its impact. There's no limit. So I ask you this morning, are you different? Are you different than the world? And are you different like Christ? And if not, you've got a choice to make. You've got a choice to make. May the Lord cause us to make a right choice. Amen? Amen. Father, we come to you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your word. and Father, we thank you for the teaching of being holy as you are holy. Father, our choice to be different. Father, certainly motivated by who you are. Father, we consider those who've gone before us as a precedent. Father, help us in our choice today. Father, remind us of the seriousness of our task. And Father, in the end, may we honor you through a right choice. We love you. Father, I pray for those who may be lost. Father, who are not saved this morning, may they make the choice of believing upon Christ. And Father, for the believer, I certainly pray Lord, that our choice would be you. Father, we love you now. Have your will away in a time of invitation, and we ask these things in Jesus' name.